please stand by. This live webcast is now about to start. Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I hear some feedback in the background. Okay. Um, Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I hear some feedback in the background. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody to our first of the five webinar training series for the CAP program. I wanted to welcome everybody to our first of the five webinar training series for the CAP program. I wanted to welcome everybody to our first of the five webinar And give me just a second here. I'm getting a lot of feedback, so I'm going to try to adjust this and see what I can do. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So, hello and welcome to the first of a proposed five webinars for the CAP program. This, these five webinars will explain why we should become certified and how to help you prepare for the CAP exam. That's the Certified Analytics Professional exam. And we'll also provide information about the analytics process, whether you're interested in taking the CAP exam or just want the information. So first, I would like to introduce our presenters. Our first presenter is Scott Nessler, a colonel in the U.S. Army at the Center for Army Analysis on Fort Belvoir former instructor at Naval Postgraduate um, School, a certified analytics professional himself, and the chair of the Analytics Certification Board. Scott has been involved with the certification project since it, was be since it began. Matt Wyndham, also a CAP, is our other presenter. Matt Pew, as I had mentioned, is a CAP and the director of analytics for Intellects. Matt will talk about some study strategies that can help you get a handle on the analytics process and put some form to a study plan. Matt has a PhD and has had lots of experience with studying for exams. The presentation will continue for about 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. If during the presentation you think of a question you want answered, please do send it in in the chat area and we will answer it for you. If we don't answer it during the presentation or we can't get to it for any reason, we will certainly follow up afterward and provide you with the answer. This webinar and the others in the series will be available after the live presentation in case you want to review any points or in case you want to let a friend or a colleague know about it. And now, without further ado, here is our first presenter, Scott Nessler. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here with you today to talk about the Certified Analytics Professional Program. As Elizabeth mentioned, I've been involved in its development and uh, governance for a few years now. So I'd, I'd like to go through a few slides that we've prepared to take you through some of the history behind the program and bring you up to date with where we are now before uh, handing it off to Matt to talk about, you know, how might you go about preparing to, uh, to attain CAP certification. So the, uh, the agenda that I'll be following is, like I mentioned, some background, a little bit of history of why and how this came to be, um, some clarification just so that people understand what certification is, um, as opposed to some other terms that are often used interchangeably but, uh, but should not be. And then I'll get into some details about the CAP program, and then Matt will cover the, uh, the study hints. And we're going to leave some time at the end of this for questions. I mean, you can go ahead and type them in at any time, and if, uh, if possible, we'll address them as we go through. But if not, we'll uh, move back to them at the end. So first off, just to make sure everyone is aware of who INFORMS is, it stands for the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. Um, it says here founded in 1952. That's not completely accurate. It was actually founded in the, the mid-1990s as a merger of two organizations that date back to just after World War II. 
Um, those were ORSA, the Operations Research Society of America, and TIM, the Institute for Management Science. They, they both realized that they had a lot of overlap in membership and uh, some common objectives, so they merged um, almost 30 years ago now and uh, became the, uh, the organization that now informs with over 11,000 members. You'll note here the, uh, the mission is listed, and the, uh, the membership has grown over the past few years. It's also transforming a bit. Historically, it's been a a very academic-focused organization. The, the practitioner piece has been growing from, you know, 10, 20 percent up to about 30 percent now. And you'll notice that we list students separately than academics, and that's because not everyone goes, you know, when they finish school in the, in the subject area, not everyone goes into academia. Some percentage of them actually become practitioners and go work for companies in industry. It's a highly educated membership with about half having an earned PhD. And, you know, as it says there, 96% either have or are working toward a master's degree. Um, so just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of, of who INFORMS is as an organization. So back when we started looking at this uh, idea of a certification program, um, one of the things was, should it be in operations research? Should it be in analytics? What's the difference? And we, we did a survey of our membership uh, a few years ago. Uh, two professors from, I believe, LaSalle University did this. It was published in Interfaces, which is an informed publication. And, and when you look at this on first glance, you see that, you know, about a third say operations research is a subset of analytics. About a third say analytics is a subset of OR. About a third say, you know, there's some intersection of these two things, and we're going to call that advanced analytics. And then a small number each say that they're the same thing or they're completely different. And when you when you first look at it on uh, at one level, you kind of get the sense that, you know, hey, these people don't know what, what the relationship between OR and analytics is. But another way, uh, like I've highlighted here on this slide, is that, you know, they're definitely related. We just sort of differ in how or to what degree are they related. So that's something I think is important to, to think about. Another way to think about them was expressed by Ann Robinson, who is a past president of our organization, and she currently works at Verizon. And she said, look, it really doesn't matter what we in the profession think about it. What matters is what are the people out in business and government, you know, that, in academia, the people that hire folks like us, what do they think about it? And... Um, you see here that the quote from her says, outside of our community, OR is seen as a toolkit, a collection of things like optimization, simulation, decision analysis, and so forth, whereas analytics is seen as a process that starts with, you know, taking a business problem, figuring out if, it's if it can be translated into an analytics problem that can be solved with you know, with data, with a model, and so forth. And I'll talk more about that process and those, what we call the, the seven domains of analytics um, in, in subsequent slides. Where at, so anyway, there's one way to view the difference between these two. And you'll note here, provided the, the official informs definition of analytics, several keywords are underlined. We view it as a process, taking data and transforming it into insights with the goal of making better decisions. That's the way we view analytics. So, you know, we aren't the only ones who think that uh, you know, analytics is important. And, uh, you know, the new wave out there, if you, if you look at, uh, at Gartner, they talk about, you know, what are the, the top strategic technology trends in the future. This is a fairly recent one. Uh, you know, it says advanced, pervasive, and invisible analytics. And they, they talk about it in depth. So it's, you know, they've been saying this for a number of years, and good news is they keep saying that analytics is, uh, is growing and is something that business needs to pay attention to. One thing I want to point out is that the CAP program, the, the certification program itself, is just one of many analytics initiatives that are underway at Informs. There's also the Informs Analytics Maturity Model, which was recently launched at our annual meeting in San Francisco. And what it does is allows organizations to introspectively look at themselves um, in terms of their organization, their data and infrastructure, 
you know, things like that to, to figure out where on a continuum, where do they fit relative to others in their, their sector or their industry along, along that, you know, where are they along that analytics maturity continuum? Are they just sort of beginning or developing or, or more advanced? And then based upon where they fall, it provides some recommendations on what are the things they ought to be thinking about or trying to do to, to move higher on that scale should they desire to do so. There's an analytics section with over a 1,000 members. There's a career center at the, the Spring Analytics Conference, and the next one of those is coming up in April in Huntington Beach, California. There's an online magazine, analytics magazine. You see the uh, web link to it there. There's continuing edu education, uh, a variety of courses. It started off with two. It's now, I think, grown to four different courses and continues to grow. And, and it isn't just with business. There's engagement with industry, government, and academia. So here is an article uh, that appeared in Analytics Magazine about a year ago. And it looked at, you know, how does it affect your career? And you can see here uh, one gentleman from SAIC, you know, answered some questions as to why he pursued certification, what he did to prepare. And there are a number of other um, individuals who were interviewed in this article. If, if, if you're interested in knowing more about why people who have sought out CAP certification did it and what they thought about it versus, you know, after going through the process, how did it compare to what they expected? There's a good article there for you to reference. There's a more recent one in Analytics Magazine that more so takes a look at, uh, from the employer perspective, why should employers support certification in analytics? And this was co-written by myself and uh, Polly Mitchell Guthrie, who's the vice chair of the Analytics Certification Board from SAS. And you know, this is kind of a, like we say, a user's guide for employers or clients of independent consultants. But we, we've done some writing to try to get, uh, get word out there and answer some of the more common questions that people have for us. So what is certification? And the reason I, I want to mention this specifically is that the words credentialing, licenses, and certification often get thrown about as if they're the same thing, and they're truly not. Um, according to a joint Department of Labor and Department of Defense study referenced at the bottom, that's now about 10 years old, it, it defines credentialing as a broad umbrella term for an official recognition you know, of some set of um, standards that you typically attain via education, training, experience, and, and maybe testing. And then it splits it into two different ones, licenses, which are mandatory to practice a particular profession that are typically granted by government organizations, usually states, but also sometimes, you know, could be local or federal. And then certifications are voluntary credentials that are granted typically by a professional organization like Informs that attest to an individual's uh, knowledge and skills. And these are often preferred or, um, you know, by employers, but they, they are not required to practice in the field. So I just want to point out very clearly, the CAP is a certification program. It's a voluntary credential, not a license. So back when we first started uh, thinking about this, initially our thought was that it was going to be a, an OR, an operations research credential or certification. And... These are some of the early concepts that we had. We knew that it had to do something with uh, education, experience, training, you know, various uh, you know, continued professional development throughout a career. You know, to, and, but what, one of the things we wanted to make sure that we allowed for was the fact that not everybody comes to this field by the same route. Um, you may sort of converge on some set of knowledge and skills and experiences, but you know, they happen in different orders and over different time periods. So we wanted to allow for that. We didn't want it to be too regimented. Um, the other graphic there at the bottom sort of shows the, the idea of, yes, there's education, experience, maybe some training, and understanding of people, processes, and technology. So these were just some early conceptual thoughts we had before it uh, actually came to be. And at this point, we were still thinking OR, not analytics. More on that here in a bit. So why did we do this? Well, about 2010, 2011, um, 
informs sort of caught the analytics bug, decided this was, you know, the way of the future. We were seeing it, hearing it from, from industry, in the media, and we kind of said, you know, look, this is a lot of what we've been doing over time, our OR analysts have been doing. We need to think about, um, you know, but what are we missing? And so we, we said we're going to establish a certification program that became the CAP, and we want to make sure that it uh, advances the use of analytics and establishes some standards of quality, identifies individuals with an appropriate breadth and depth of knowledge, and I'll talk more on that here in a little bit. We, we wanted it to be a uh, certification that isn't just once and done. There needs to be continued professional development to show that you, you remain competent and current with your skills. And a few additional goals there at the bottom. We didn't want it to be specific to any one software or vendor or product, open to anyone who meets the criteria. In other words, you don't need to be an informed member to, um, to seek or earn the CAP certification. There are discounts given to informed members, but you don't need to be a member. And then the other thing that was important was that the program itself be eligible for accreditation um, under the, uh, you know, the ISO standards you know, shown here. The um, the importance of this is particularly with regard to the federal government and other government organizations that in order for them to recognize and for some larger companies to recognize certification programs, the programs themselves must be accredited. And uh, we're just coming up uh, in a few months, actually. We've been around for between one and a half and two years. It takes a minimum of two years to be to get a program accredited. So we're getting close to where we're going to apply for formally apply for accreditation, but the program has been developed with that in mind all along. Okay, what are the benefits of certification? And these are typically, these ones listed here are typically from the perspective of an individual. Now, well, it sets you apart and advances your you know, potential career opportunities. Shows a level of competence in, in the practice of analytics and you'll notice this word practice showing up a lot. It doesn't just have to do with book or school learning. You, you actually have to have done work in this area in order to obtain the certification. And that's it's a very, very much a practice-based certification. Um, if you want to maintain your certification, like I said, it requires um, continuing education. And uh, that shows a continued investment in your individual career and a commitment to the profession. Has the potential to boost uh, salary. This is not uncommon for certifications in, in a variety of fields. Um, provides a measure of personal satisfaction. Can be viewed as a career milestone, sort of like earning a, a degree but a little different. And you know, it shows. Uh, this one's more maybe from a company perspective or from for a uh, an individual. Consultant in analytics shows that you adhere to you know some industry standard of, of practice. So who's the governing body for this board? It's the Analytics Certification Board, which I chair. It's been around since July 2013, shortly after the program launched. Prior to that, there was a, a task force that had been around that did the program development that was largely from within Informs. When we um, actually launched the program, though, we said, look, we need to get people that are not just informed members. Now, many or several of these folks are informed members, but there are some up there that are not. Um, you'll see that we have representation from um, academia, from the government, and from industry, from companies. Um, you know, schools that are up there, you know, there's Babson College, Tom Davenport, a fairly big name in the analytics space, Terry Harrison with Penn State. Uh, Don Kleinman's at Notre Dame, and so forth. Um, actually, I should update one here. It says Jeannie Harris is with Accenture. She recently retired from Accenture and is now uh, most closely aligned with Columbia University in New York. Um, then you see the companies there, places like Teradata, um, Disney, Gartner, General Motors. Um, you know, these, these are not fly-by-night organizations you're seeing here. So just want to show that there is some buy-in from those in, in the analytics profession at companies like these. So this is the, the governing body. We meet once a month uh, by a telephone or a web conference and once a year in person and set the strategic direction for the program. 
and uh, manage the, the oversight of it. Mm -hmm. One key point here is we are a, I guess you'd call us a semi-autonomous um, board of directors from the, the actual INFORMS board of directors, although we get funding from INFORMS for our operating budget. Um, for accreditation perspective or uses, we have to be somewhat semi-independent from them, which is why we have people who are not INFORMS members as well. I mentioned this shape. I mentioned breadth and depth earlier. And there's a uh, uh, there's a quote out there uh, from Nicholas D'Onofrio that I like. Or uh, and here's a, a reference out of a uh, publication called Analyzing the Analyzers. And it talks to this idea of T-shapes, where the top of the T is the you know the breadth of the the skills that an individual has, with depth in one area, which is what the vertical bar um, represents. And the benefits that uh, that people have seen with T-shaped professionals as opposed to I-shaped professionals who, you know, know a lot about one thing but not much about anything else. But the benefit to T-shaped um, professionals is that they are very good at working in interdisciplinary teams, um, but yet bring, um, you know, their specialized expertise to the table as well. So when we looked at this, we said, well, what part are we going to go at here in our certification program? When we initially started developing the program, there was a little bit of pushback from our academic community within INFORMS, and they kind of said, well, wait a minute, our degrees are our credentials, are our certification. Why, you know, why do we need something else? And this idea, I think, eventually sort of won them over, and we said, look, it's you know, the degrees are that depth in a, in a particular area, especially for someone that has a Ph.D. or a master's degree in a particular field. The breadth piece is what we're going to go after, and I'm going to talk in more specifics about that. And it isn't just knowing buzzwords or, you know, a, a half an inch deep and knowing a little bit about everything. Um, there is some depth to it, but the point is that it, it spans a, a fairly wide range. So we have these seven domains that are shown here at the bottom of the slide that sort of walk through that process that I mentioned, business problem framing, taking that business problem that a, a customer, a client, or your company has, and figuring out how do I translate that into an analytics problem that I can then solve. Hopefully I can find some data, get the data, you know, bring it into uh, whatever system is appropriate to whatever manipulation I need to, pick a methodology to use on that data, build a model if I need to, deploy it, and maintain it throughout its life cycle. The, um, I guess I should point out that it isn't just a linear process from one through seven. There are multiple feedback loops throughout this. So these are the, the domains in which the tasks and knowledge statements that uh, essentially form the outline of the analytics body of knowledge come from. So the tasks are the things you have to be able to do, and the knowledge statements are the things you have to know in order to be able to do those tasks. Remember I mentioned it's a practice-based um, certification and exam. So how important are these domains relative to one another? Well, we went out and asked a bunch of subject matter experts, how often do you do things in each of these domains? How important do you consider each of them? You know, how critical are they? And uh, there's a method out there to combine those two pieces of information, and we came up with a, uh, you know, a number, a percentage, essentially, for each of the seven domains. If you pick the number that's in the middle of the range is shown. So, for example, you know, 15% for business problem framing, 16% for um, analytics problem framing, and so you'll see what the single number is, but we allow individual exams to range you know, plus or minus a few questions. And we'll, we'll talk more about the exam here in a little bit. So note that data is the most heavily weighted um, domain here. Um, the methodology, the, the problem framing, the model building are also fairly heavily weighted. The deployment and life cycle management domains are, you know, slight, slightly lower weighted or about half of what the other ones are. 
One thing I want to point out is initially in our first year, we were only offering the exam, which is one of the five E's that I'm going to talk about here shortly. Um, we were only offering the exam at our conferences in person as a pencil and paper exam, or we would take it out to a, an organization that wanted to have one administered on site. Um, we've since gone to a global model um, using computer-based testing earlier this year uh, through a company called Criterion. I'll show you uh, where they're located here in a little bit. But the bottom line is you can take the exam any time that it suits you at a place that is, for most people, pretty, pretty close, not too far away. Um, you see where CAPS currently are. We've got 32 of the 50 states covered, eight countries, and more than 10% of the Fortune 100 companies. All right, so where can you take the test? If you go to Criterion Online, there's a link there to find a testing center. And uh, you can see the, the drop down here where you select, uh, you know, your country and then your state and click on the Show Centers button, and it'll tell you how many there are. So where are they all? Well, Here's a map. As you see, there's a whole lot of them in the United States, a fair number in Europe, a smaller number spread throughout uh, South Asia, you know, other places around the world, um, fewer in Africa and South America, but uh, you know, pretty well lines up with where the demand for exams. So you can go to any one of these locations and uh, take an exam you know, if you uh, go through the process of applying and registering. So the five E's, I mentioned this, it's not just an exam. Um, there's, first off, there's a mix of education and experience, uh, requires a bachelor's degree or higher, and then depending what your degree is in and what level it is, it requires from three to seven years experience. So someone with a bachelor's degree in a non-related area uh, would require seven years of work experience in the analytics field, whereas if you have a master's degree or higher in a related area, only three years of experience is required. I mentioned the exam. Um, I'll talk a little more about that on the next slide. There's also a verification of effectiveness of soft skills. So it isn't about just isn't just about being able to do the math. We want to make sure that our uh, certified analytics professionals can communicate to uh, to their leadership, to customers and clients. And finally, uh, you must agree to a code of ethics. It's fairly short, not too difficult to read, and uh, just basically says, you know, hey, I'm going to keep the best interests of, of the company, of the, uh, of, the, of the client in mind there. All right, so the, the test, the, the assessment mm -hmm. instrument, as our uh, folks call it. Um, it's 100 multiple choice questions. You get three hours to complete it. Most people take more than two, but typically less than two and a mm -hmm. half. The only people who typically um, stay around till three hours are there sort of just double and triple checking their answers. There's only one correct answer to each of the questions, which means there are three plausible detractors or distractors in each question. It's weighted according to the job task analysis, the percentages I showed you for the seven domain. The items are created and reviewed by subject matter experts. Um, I mean, some of them are created by the same people that review them, but we have more people who actually contribute questions and then they're reviewed typically by a, a smaller group. And if needed, we'll, we'll go out and seek additional reviewers in, in particular areas where we uh, feel we need a, another set of eyes or two. So how are the items classified? I mentioned that they're, they're linked to the job task analysis. In other words, they're, each question has a domain, a task, statement and a knowledge statement with which it is identified, and that, uh, that job task analysis is essentially the, you know, the, the blueprint or the outline for the, the analytics body of knowledge, which we are currently working to flesh out more fully. Um, we want to make sure that we establish a linkage to the fact that it's related to practice. Um, by doing this, also, it helps with content validity, which is something psychometricians care a great deal about, even though most of us don't necessarily deal with it in our daily lives. Um, but this is important to, you know, prevent uh, legal challenges and it just generally makes for a stronger, better exam. Um, I sort of covered this already, why it's important to make sure that it's a high-quality exam, to make sure that it's accurate, to make sure that it's fair 
make sure that it's valid and to make sure that the measurement error of you know, what we're testing, which is knowledge, those knowledge and task statements within those seven domains, make sure that it says doing, doing that as well as it possibly can and make sure that we're correctly classifying, meaning meets the standard or doesn't meet the standard, um, those candidates that apply for the certification. So how do you prepare? Um, We'll, we'll cover, Matt will cover this in more detail, um, some specific ideas and strategies, but in general, there's a free study guide available out there. There's a candidate handbook, which also has some sample questions and answers. There's a list of key references for the different domains. I mean, you don't necessarily have to go study all seven domains. Chances are, if you're like most individuals, you're stronger in two or three or four of them than you are the other two or three or four. And you know, maybe do a little bit of review in the areas where uh, you, you feel pretty comfortable, but spend more of your time on uh, on the ones where you where you think you need additional work, and that's where the references might come in handy. Uh, there are continuing education classes available, like I mentioned. See there the website, informs.org slash certification. Everything you can pretty much get to uh, from, from that link. Okay, so once you've attained the CAP certification, how do you maintain it? Well, every three years you have to recertify. You have to take the exam again? No, you don't. But what you need to do is earn at least 30 PDUs, or professional development units, and each PDU is effectively one hour of activity from the five categories shown in the table here. Um, you know, formal education and training programs, you know, one per hour, and you have to earn at least eight in this category. That's the only one that actually has a minimum. Um, Self-directed learning, creating new analytics, knowledge, volunteer service, again, one per hour, but those have a maximum of 10. So you can't earn all of your um, professional development units by volunteering a whole lot, for example. Only 10 of the 30 can be earned that way. And then finally, by working in the field, um, you get five PDUs per year of full-time employment. So you can earn 15 out of the 30 just by continuing to work in the field um, and being a practitioner. So it's not terribly difficult, but it does show continued commitment to your career and the profession, which is what we want to ensure. Okay, a little bit of demographics. Uh, there is a certification registry out there. Um, you can look and see you know, who the people are, where they are. Um, there's currently 184 or so. I think there's a few more than that since the slides had been done. Um, one thing to realize is some people don't wish to be listed on a public website, so we honor their wishes and don't list them there. So, you know, there may actually be some number more than that that you don't see there. And we mentioned we're in nine. I think it's now ten. No, I guess nine countries is right, although I think I saw one, another one recently. The number is growing. I mentioned that you know, more than 10% of the Fortune 100 companies have one or more caps on their staff. Those are the Fortune 100 companies you see there. Those with uh, larger text indicate the ones that have, uh, you know, at least one or maybe more caps among their uh, analytic staff. One of the things that uh, we've been doing is facing this chicken or egg problem where, you know, companies are hesitant to say, hey, we, we'd like to hire people who are CAPS um, because there aren't that many of them out there. And then individuals hold off on applying for it because they say, well, nobody's specifically asking for it. Well, the good news is, for the program anyway, um, and for those who have earned the certification, is that companies are now asking for it. Macy's, Quintiles, GM, Booz Allen Hamilton have all um, you know, essentially recognized the, the CAP as a way to uh, ensure that they're they're hiring a quality analytics professional, and, and they're now asking for um, CAP certificates, and we're saying that they prefer them in their in their job listings that are posted out there. So that's a that's an, a good recent development. Uh, we were in the news recently in CIO Magazine as one of, in fact, the first of 11 big data certifications that will pay off. This was back in July. Um, we like seeing that. We were completely shocked when this came out. When we hadn't reached out to them and said, hey, don't forget to include us. No, none of that. They, somebody learned about it and uh, put it out there, which we were very excited to see. Um, 
other things out there. Here's one that appeared in the Swiss Analytics uh, magazine or journal um, from Poly, and it, it takes the idea of a, a guild, you know, kind of the journeyman, craftsman type uh, approach to things, uh, which, which is very interesting. But just pointing out that, uh, you know, it's not just in the United States, but elsewhere that, uh, that we're reaching out to analytics professionals as well. Um, here's one from uh, Information Week. It was out recently talking about CAP. Uh, here's another one. can't recall which one this uh, was in, but good news is we're getting some favorable press out there. Uh, you know, over the past uh, couple of years. This was an article or actually a guest blog post I'd done through Birchworks, uh, which is a recruiting firm out of Chicago. And uh, we got a lot of really good... Uh, from that. And here you can see I had a, uh, was interviewed by the, uh, the Analytics India magazine a couple of months ago, and we, we are now starting to see and have the first applicants and first certificates from India uh, with the CAP. And there's, I forget what it is, I want to say 20 some or maybe even as many as 30 or 40 um, test locations in India. So there's demand from all over the world. Those of you that work in the field probably know who uh, Gregory is. Uh, KB Nuggets is his uh, Twitter handle there. He, uh, he's he been following us and uh, you know, unsolicited posted this out there earlier this year. All right. That's my, that wraps up my overview here. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Matt here to talk about, you know, how can you go about preparing for the exam. And uh, if you have questions on anything I've covered, go ahead and type them in, and I'll take a look at them while Matt's presenting. And then uh, once he's done, I'll come back and answer them. Thanks. All yours, Matt. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And uh, in, the, in the interest of everyone's time, I'll be uh, relatively brief. Uh, but we have uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, – study strategies for the exam. There's a lot of concern by potential applicants about, well, you know, there's so much information included, you know, the seven areas. Uh, what do I, what do I study? Where do I, where do I focus? Uh, so I thought this would actually be the, uh, the best way to, to approach it. Uh, you know, I think, you know, everyone that is applying has at least a bachelor's degree, many have master's, and, and some even have PhDs. And so, uh, you're all quite familiar with uh, standardized testing that you go through in, in, uh, at the collegiate level, uh, SATs, GREs. Uh, and so the preparation strategies that, that really apply to the CAP exam are really no different. Um, there, and there are essentially five key strategies I wanted to go over today uh, so that you get a sense of, of how to prepare uh, efficiently and effectively uh, for the exam. There, uh, you know, as, as Scott pointed out, there are some good resources out there online. Uh, I encourage you to, to go seek those out uh, to, to get the information you need to actually apply these, uh, these strategies. Uh, so there are five key strategies. Reduce interference, space it out, use whole and partial learning, recite it, and use the system. So I'll go over yeah, each, of these, uh, each of these five over the next few slides. Um, in order for you to, to really try to build a, a strategy for, for studying for the exam effectively. So interference, what is it? Uh, when you're learning new material, it's easy for confusion to occur when uh, you're overlapping different kinds of material or you've learned two different subjects very closely together. Essentially, uh, your, your recall capability is, is, is reduced. You, you can't formulate the, the memories that you need. Uh, to, to recall the memory uh, correctly. So it's, uh, there are some strategies to reduce this, uh, this notion of interference. Uh, so these are the ways you do that. Overlearn the material. Truly mastering the, the topic is, um, is critical to really avoiding interference in preparation for the, for the exam. Uh, so really knowing it inside and out. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of obvious, right? And, and it's a fairly basic notion, but, uh, it really is important, uh, for, for you to effectively prepare. Uh, make it meaningful. 
this is really, as you would, might expect, not just learning by rote, but really understanding the concepts behind the various pieces of information that you're learning. Uh, this is especially important when you're getting into the um, you know, statistical analysis, data data analysis pieces of, of the, um, the exam preparation. Uh, it, minimize intervening activity. Uh, I, I'm being somewhat flippant by saying go to sleep, but really uh, you, you should try to minimize the other activities that are related to uh, to your studied material uh, immediately after a study session. So really, you know, studying before uh, before you go to sleep is, is actually a great way to avoid this. Uh, some, you know, some employers offer you time at work to study, and that's a great thing, but sometimes it can be difficult if you, say, study on your lunch break, and then you go back to doing your job. You can build up interference with what you studied. Uh, so you have to be careful to to avoid some of that and, and just build a strategy that's good for you. Uh, and studying similar subjects together can be uh, can create this interference. Uh, you, it's good to actually pick different topics to study uh, in similar time frames or in the same study session so that you can avoid interference. Um, and so uh, also this notion of uh, location in terms of building memories uh, studying subjects in different locations uh, can can help you uh, build a memory that associated with that location, so that you have a stronger recall of that information. If you if you say pick a particular desk or a particular uh, look uh, spot in your house in your home, uh, and you always study that subject in the, in that area, it helps to reinforce the material every time you go back to that uh, that same location, that same environment. Uh, so it's good for you to repetitively study in the same areas and, and help you formulate those memories uh, more uh, more effectively. Uh, and really do uh, avoid uh, cram sessions. Really use separate study sessions for uh, for different subjects if you can. Uh, you want to avoid, not only do you want to avoid similar subjects, but it really is best to avoid uh, different subjects in the same study session altogether. And so that's, those are different ways you can re reduce interference. In terms of, uh, oops, uh, there we go. So, in, and space it out is a second strategy. Uh, so it's, it, this is that same concept of avoiding uh, cram sessions, but a little differently. Uh, instead of doing a marathon study session, you really want to uh, space out your study sessions into numerous sessions over a period of time so that you can uh, improve attend, uh, improve your recall. Uh, so why why are study sessions or cram sessions, uh, I, I should say, why are cram sessions a problem? So it, it, you have attention limits, and there's an issue with you for actually developing, uh, actually executing the, the memory recall, the consolidation element of your memory building, and um, repeat contexts is really important. So these three elements are really critical to, uh, to the strategy of spacing out your study sessions. Attention limits, I think this one's fairly obvious. You have uh, only the ability to, to attend, uh, pay attention to the same material for uh, a certain period of time. And then as your attention degrades, so does your ability to actually formulate those memories as you learn the information. And, uh, and so learning ultimately suffers. Um, Consolidation is the process of, of actually the neurons building memories in, in, your, in your brain. And so this activity takes time, and it takes time after you've actually done, done a learning session, a study session. So your, um, your consolidation uh, efforts in the brain are actually inhibited when you have extended periods of studying because the the, uh, the brain can't recover from the new information that it's, it has uh, obtained. Uh, so it's really important to do uh, shorter sessions and, and more of them in order to have this consolidation uh, actually occur and build memories. Um, repeat context, again, this is going back to the idea of, of avoiding interference. It, if you're repeating the same context over and over again, it helps to build memories uh, over time, and so having that repeat exposure to those those same environments, those same learning environments, uh, is really important 
for building memories. Um, and just a, a tip to throw in here is uh, it's better to study easier subjects in longer chunks and harder subjects in smaller chunks. Um, yeah, if, if the material is easier, your, uh, your consolidation is not as challenged, your attention limits are, are uh, longer, and your, uh, it's, it just is not as difficult for your brain to actually develop the, the memory. So it is, uh, but for the harder subjects, you really do need to, to break it up into smaller chunks so that you don't, uh, don't have some of these, these issues. Um, so I'm going to go to whole and partial learning. Um, whole versus part learning, it's, it's uh, just terminology for how you approach the material. And so how do you break up the material? How do you chunk it? Um, when you actually, uh, for whole learning, it's really the, the approach of uh, going straight through a subject or a, a set of subjects for, for your study session. So it's very linear. You, you pick a book and you read it front, uh, cover to cover. Uh, for part learning, you take the same material and you break it up into pieces, and you might study them in different orders, uh, or you might study them in different sessions and, and, and the like. So those are two uh, two strategies that can be seen as extremes on a continuum. But um, really, what most people do, and these are these strategies that I've outlined here, uh, are actually a blend of those two approaches. And it again, goes back to what's you know some of the easier subjects and the harder subjects. It's uh, it's better to use a blend of these different approaches in order to effectively uh, adapt to your your environment, your your uh, learning needs, uh, et cetera. So uh, one of them is uh, whole with extra parts focus. Uh, this is reading straight through the material uh, very carefully to get a, a sound understanding, and then picking out different difficult subjects to uh, to study uh, separately in, in different sessions. Um, that can be very effective depending on your learning style. Uh, whole part, whole method is uh, working straight through all the material very quickly. Then you break it up into its discrete pieces and study separately some of those difficult parts that you had trouble with or what have you. Uh, and then going back through the material end to end. So it's really using uh, whole and, and partial learning uh, together very effectively. Um, Progressive part method, this one is uh, much more time intensive, but it, uh, depending on your learning style and the kinds of material that you're studying, this can be very effective. Uh, you break up the material into segments, and you start with the first segment and go through each segment, but as you get to a new segment, you actually go back through linearly every prior segment. So if you uh, were studying subjects, say, one through five, you would start with one, then you would go to two, but you would actually restudy one and two, and then when you went to three, you would study one, two, and three, uh, four, you do one through four, and, and so on and so forth. So you, you um, are iteratively reviewing all the material you've already seen before. Uh, again, these are not meant to be prescriptive, but really uh, ideas for you based on your learning style and the subject, and it really is your discretion as to how you do that. Um, so four, this, uh, this seems fairly elementary. It's, uh, it's actually a very effective technique. Uh, recite it. So reciting the information back to yourself after you've read it, after you've learned it, uh, reciting those concepts, those high-level concepts that you've, you've taken away from the material, is very effective because if you force yourself to do that and you can't effectively, uh, you can't effectively recite it to yourself and answer your own questions, then you haven't really understood the information, and it helps you identify, self-identify uh, places where you need to go back and, and revisit in, uh, pieces of information. Uh, and it's a good, good technique for you to, uh, to identify uh, hot spots. And what are some benefits? Uh, it really is an active learning technique. Uh, recitation, it requires, it really requires the engagement of multiple uh, portions of your brain. And so you actually end up uh, learning the information more effectively because you're really uh, using more parts of your brain to retain the information. Um, it uh, creates a feedback loop that, that I just discussed, and it forces you to concentrate on the material uh, more effectively than if you just read it and think about the material. Uh, recitation is just a uh, – it's an – 
it's a device for uh, for really getting that feedback and forcing your brain to think about it in different ways and engaging different senses. Um, so if we go on to number five, I know we're getting tight on time, so I, I apologize. I, I might be rushing a bit, but I just we want to be respectful of everyone's hour. Uh, so then five is using a system. Uh, there are many systems out there for for studying, uh, for standardized exams, and uh, you can you can do some web searching and find a lot. But um, this is one that's quite common because it's one of the oldest techniques out there. It's called the FQ3R, uh, the Survey, Question, Read, Recite, and Review. Um, this is a system that is, is generic enough that you can actually use it for a lot of different subjects, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's so, uh, so popular. Uh, survey is just uh, starting to uh, get a sense of the material you're about to study. You re review it, outline it, uh, you look at table of contents of a book, you get to just get a sense of the material you're about to uh, about the study. You then question, uh, develop questions about the material based on that survey of information. Um, you, you really start to write down questions that you want to try and answer as you go through the material in, in a more detailed way. Uh, and then read. Of course, you, you actually read the material, you digest it, understand it. Uh, you then go through that recitation process after you've read it to make sure that you have understood what you read and create more questions from that. Uh, and then you review. You really take a few minutes to kind of sit down at the end of your study session and assess what did you learn? What did you, uh, what did you understand? What did you have trouble with? And that helps you to plan for your next study session. So this is really a process that you can go through with every study session to make sure that you are really acquiring the information that you set out to uh, as, uh, as effectively as you, as you would like. Um, so that's the last technique. This was an example plan um, that, that is developed. It's really hard to come up with a, a solid plan for these because everyone's different. Everyone's learning style is different. Uh, the gaps you have in your, in your own knowledge base, uh, it's going to vary widely for, for everyone. Uh, and that's, you know, that's also, as uh, Scott pointed out earlier, uh, that's why we have this exam. It really is a level setting, uh, it's providing that, that standard, that gold standard in the industry for what's expected of professionals. And it's really forcing you to, to kind of fill in these gaps that you might have. Um, but based on the approximate weightings uh, put out there, published by, by Informs uh, for the various domain elements, this was just a notional sense of how much time you might expect uh, in a three-month period uh, for preparation. So based on, you know, let's say you had three months to prepare, uh, based on the percentages, this is how many days you might expect to study these different pieces of information. Uh, that It might seem like a lot to you. It might, might seem like very little. But uh, these are just guidelines, just like the approximate weightings are just guidelines for how much information um, of, of each informa uh, piece of information is on there. Uh, these are just guidelines to make you think about how much time you're committing to each of the subject, uh, subjects out there. Um, you really do have to do a self-assessment before you go down this pathway to really see, well, how much time do I need to commit to, say, data or model building, et cetera. Um, and again, you know, you can you can flex this uh, back and forth for uh, for your study timeline. If you have a month or if you have six, you can really spread it out and, and change it up as you need. Uh, and, and again, applying those those techniques for avoiding interference and uh, and trying to spread it out as much as you can, given whatever time frame you have. Um, so that's that's it, <coughs> and uh, I will. I'll also gladly take questions uh, if uh, if any any have have some questions out there. And Scott, do you want to answer any questions that have come up while you've uh, while I've been talking? Yeah, let me let me go ahead and do that. It appears you answered one of them already, Matt, which had to do with you know what if you're strong in some subject areas and weak in others. I think you adequately covered that. There's about five more which I will take. Um, one of them is, what is the passing score for this exam? Well, the passing score varies from one form of the exam or one version of it to
to another, the passing score is not actually published. I can tell you that the current passing rate is about 70%. In other words, about 70% of the individuals who have taken it have passed it. Um, there's a question about what qualifies as a self-learning PDU. For example, would participating in a, in a MOOC, a massive open online course like Coursera or Udacity count for that? Yes, it most certainly would. I had a question about someone or from someone with a bachelor's degree in computer science um, and engineering and an MBA in and a master's in survey research and me methodology who works as a statistical research assistant. And, you know, with six years of, yes, that more than certainly qualifies you. Um, that you would only need three years with that combination of degrees. You would certainly be eligible to take the exam. Um, someone asked about the, the vendor neutrality and software neutrality piece, they said when they were looking for a, uh, for a position for employment, that it seemed like um, they ran into employers that wanted to know how much of a particular uh, statistical programming language they knew. And that, that seemed to be what they were looking for. Well, I don't know. Yes, there are some employers that are looking for that, and then there are specific certification courses out there for a particular statistical language or particular programming language. However, they aren't broad in the sense of covering the entire you know, set of seven domains, the process, the business problem framing, the communication, all of that kind of stuff. So it really depends what it is you, you want to seek certification in. Um, I'm currently in a job search myself. I interviewed with a company that was very much um, dependent on one particular software program or language, and I told them, look, I really don't have a background in this. Mine is in this one, this other one, and this other other one. And they said, that's okay. We can teach it to you. So I, I guess it really varies. Um, someone asked if it's possible to download the webinar series to review later. Yes, I believe that that will be available. I, I believe you will get a um, an email afterward Basically, anyone who registered, whether they attended in a live the live session or not, I believe, will get an email um, telling them, you know, giving them the link to it. And or if you did attend, I think you still could go back and watch part of it over again if you wanted to. Um, I think that's all the questions that I've seen asked at this point. If there are others, we have about. Um, Looks like about three minutes remaining. I'll turn it back over to you, Matt, if you've thought of anything else to cover while I was uh, answering those questions. If you have further questions, go ahead and uh, type them in, though. Thanks. Yeah, I, well, I don't have anything to add, but, uh, you know, again, we're happy to, to take any other questions with the last couple minutes we have. If not, we're, uh, we certainly appreciate your, your time and attention today, and thank you for your interest in the CAP, and we hope you all uh, apply and take the exam and pass and become CAPs along with us. I will uh, leave this final slide up on the screen here. If you have additional questions, uh, go ahead and look at our website there, informs.org slash certification. Alternately, Send an email to certification at informs.org. That goes directly to um, Dr. Louise Worley, our certification manager at Informs, or you can call her at the number shown there on the screen. If she can't answer your question, she'll pass it to one of us, and we will uh, close the loop with you. Thank you for uh, attending the webinar, and uh, look forward to uh, talking with some of you in the future. Have a great day.